Happy Sorry. birthday! Hey! Birthday man! How did you know it was my birthday? Facebook. Ah, Facebook. Facebook, yes. I felt so honored that you Facebook. would accept an invitation for an interview at your birthday. All right. Cool. Here we go. Do you see me now? Yeah, I do. Oh, I saw you before, hi. but now I see you almost life-size on my little screen. <laughs> okay, the well of remembrance, of course, it made such an impression on me. Because, like, like you said, that it was like you were called uh, by Odin. I yeah. had the same feeling, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mailed, I, I don't know if you read it, but I mailed you the dream about the wanderer that I um, met on the street. And I gave him food. I, I suspected him to be an alcoholic, a wanderer, a, a drug addict. Yeah. And so I wanted, and that is so, yeah, like you have the, the same conclusion you came to with the Green Earth uh, website. I wanted to buy him good food because I suspected him to be a drug addict. So I didn't want to give him money, but I wanted to give him proper food from Mother oh, Earth. Right. And uh, then I paid for the groceries and we went outside. And then the first time in that dream, I looked into his face and I saw this eye that was missing. Mm. And it scared the crap out of me. So uh -huh. I just stumbled. Oh, I'm late for a meeting. And I ran away. And I really? just... Really? Yeah, what? I didn't hear you. You didn't give him the food? I, I gave him the food already in but the then, supermarkets. Uh, yeah. Yes. But then yeah. I, I, I sneaked out with an excuse. And you know what I did when I woke up? I uh, made an appointment to have my eyes checked because I'm diabetic. I uh, thought it was a, a warning dream. Well, that, dream was... that dream, the dream that you mentioned, that's yeah? Odin. Yeah. You met yeah. Odin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And in disguise, I did... of course. Oh, it's disguised. It's disguised. Yeah, but when, when I saw that famous picture of him with the hat, then I gasped my breath. I thought, oh, that's him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the guy. Yeah. yeah. And I once had a dream about the well. So I want to talk to you in the interview about wells and um, yeah. their, um, their meaning. Hello, my name is Suzanne van Loren. I'm the founder of Mindfunda, a daily blog about psychology, mythology and spirituality. Um, if you sign up on my YouTube channel, you can view a lot of good movies. And uh, if you tune in to www.mindfunda.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. You'll get a monthly newsletter with the latest news about dreaming. And you can grab yourself a free ebook about mutual dreaming. So please sign up. Today I'm talking with a man who is a psychologist, a Harvard School psychologist, who is um, a therapist, who does group uh, work, and who is specialized in consciousness. And he is an author of several dreams, um, The Unfolding Self, Green Psychology, really appeals to me and uh, one book that really really changed the way I look at the world and it's called The Well of Remembrance. So I mailed uh, Mr. Ralph Metzner because that is his name Ralph Metzner mm -hmm. um, to, tonight to join me for a talk and good evening Ralph Metzner. Good How evening. are you today? I'm good I'm good glad to uh, connect with you. Mm -hmm. And I would appreciate if you could give a c connection to my website. Oh, of Did course, you know of course. Yes. Website and your website? It's yeah. www.greenearthfound. Green, Green, Green Earth Found. Found. Dot org. Dot org. Yes. yes. I, have I will a, write it in my blog also. Yes, I have an organization called the Green Earth Foundation, which mm -hmm. publishes my books and distributes them. And mm -hmm. So, and I have a newsletter you can sign up for, all of that. So mm -hmm. that would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. So, Ralph, in your book, The Well of Remembrance, you talk about the wisdom seeker, Odin. 
-hmm. And Odin is an old um, mythological figure. Mm -hmm. And The Well of Remembrance Mm -hmm. is such a remarkable book that it has some information that is valid for all of us. Because Mm -hmm. let me tell you something about the book. And it's on the backside of your book. And it's why it's it's so important for all of us. This book explores some of the mythic roots of the Western worldview. The worldview of the culture that, for better or worse, has come to dominate the world's peoples. This domination has involved not only economic, economic and political systems, but also values, basic attitudes, religious beliefs, language, scientific understanding, and technological applications. Many individuals, tribes, and nations are struggling to free themselves from the residues of the ideological oppression practiced by what they see as Eurocentric culture. They seek to define their own ethnic or national identities by referring to ancestral traditions and mythical patterns of knowledge. At this time, it seems appropriate for Europeans and Euro-Americans, likewise, to probe their own ancestral mythology for insight and self-understanding. And that really pins down the significance of this book and why I think that everybody should read it. And we were talking about, uh, just a minute ago, about Odin, Mm. the wisdom seeker, and his relevance for the uh, mythology of Europe and Mm. Americans. Mm -hmm. And, Ralph... So many Americans are descended from from Europeans. Yes, I love the phrase Euro-Americans. Thank you for that that, um, uh, introductory paragraph, uh, which is that Yes, Nordic, what we call Nordic Germanic mythology, uh, but then also very closely related in parallel or uh, sim- similar in spirit is Celtic. Mm-hmm. So the yeah. Celtic Scottish mythology, very similar myths in many ways. And so Euro- Western Europe and the Euro Americans, you know, descended, Americans descended from Western Europeans, those two mythological streams are both. Very relevant, Germanic and Celtic. So yeah, from the Indo-European people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the Indo-Europeans includes more than just the Germanic and Celtic, because mm-hmm. it also includes Slavic and many others, you know, Mediterranean. So. Yeah, you describe that in the first part of your book, the origins yeah. of those Indo-European people, and. Um, if if we go back to Odin, you say he's a wisdom seeker, a knowledge delver. He he da- delves for knowledge, and one of the important ways that you say I'm I'm a German guy, I, I was d- descended from Germans, and my parents never talked about the war. And one of the ways what that Odin um, gets his knowledge is from his ancestors. So I knew that I had to do something and you did something that I really, really admire and that I really want you to talk about. Your your family is from German origin and you actually, did... Actually, no, my, my father is German origin. My mother is actually English, Scottish. Uh-huh. Yeah. Scotland. Yes. So it's Celtic. Celtic. Mm-hmm. Celtic. Celtic. Mm-hmm. Yes. And what did you do to build that bridge to your ancestral knowledge? Well, I started reading, started reading and studying the myths. You know, so uh, I had already been interested in mythology because I was a psychologist you know, mm-hmm. and I was interested in Jung, and I was very interested in myth. And when I grew up, you know, in uh, I grew up in Germany uh, as a as a young child and then as a teenager in Europe, and and people, my father was, you know, read me books about as other children about Greek and Roman mythology. <laughs> in the, in the post war uh, years, nobody ever really talked about Germanic mythology. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, um, or Celtic mythology for that matter. I was reading about the Greeks and the Romans, you know, yeah. the gods, Hermes and Zeus and uh, Aphrodite and all, all those kind of things, and the Romans. And uh, uh, much later in life, because of but I began to think about, um, well, why is that? You know, how come we never heard about 
Germanic mythology and Nordic mythology. And that's why I came up with the idea, well, there was a kind of curse in Germanic mythology. And the reason is the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the Nazis talked about Germanic mythology and, you know, Hitler. But they didn't actually know anything about it. They didn't really, they they've confabulated, they made up this ideology and said this has to do with the human soul and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So bullshit. Yeah. You know, because the, the core of the ideology of the Nazis was this kind of regimented thing. Everybody march in lockstep. Everybody march in lockstep and obey. Well, the core of the Germanic and Celtic mythology is nothing like that. You don't see anything like that. You don't see fascism. It's the end of the core myths of Odin, like the core myths is like the core myths of Hermes in Greek. He's an individual seeker. He's an individual seeker who connects with the spirits of nature. Um, he doesn't talk about the th th mythology. There's nothing about the mythology of the folk or the folk or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a fantasy. It's a medieval, late 19th century fantasy. In the late 19th century, there were all kinds of uh, Celtic, Swedish, and other you know, European scholars who made up these fantasies about uh, European Germanic mythology, Nordic Germanic mythology. And that stream still exists in kind of pop yeah. culture. But see, I was very influenced by Ma Maria Gambutas' work. Yeah. He's a Lithuanian uh, archaeologist, mythologist. I know. Well, yeah. Was, yeah. You know, really rewritten the whole history and pointed out to the much deeper, deeper roots, the pre-Indo-European, the Indo-European, and then the pre-Indo-European. Mm -hmm. There were people in Europe before the pre-Indo-European, before yes. the. Indo they call them the old Europeans. Yes. So I'm very interested in those layers. Now, yeah, and and where did this come from? Your. You, your interest in the goddess and in Maria Kimbutas? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, it just rose naturally in my <laughs> in the course of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I did have a dream. I talked about a dream at very uh, sometime in the mid '80s. I forget exactly when, because uh, I had already been interested in mind-expanding drugs. You see, in the mm -hmm. early '60s, uh -huh. but I was just a materialistically oriented psychologist. I didn't know anything about any mythology at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you just wanted to experience the consciousness and what, what, to what length the consciousness could go. Yeah, I had a dream in which uh, uh, I actually looked at a, a stone head of, from the uh, Mayan Mesoamerican culture, which I'm not related to at all. And uh, in the dream, this giant stone head, uh, you've probably seen pictures of it. Uh, I suddenly noticed that uh, the eye was opening. Wow. wow. So it was like a flittering under the eyelids. And I thought, oh, my the eye is going to open. And at the same time, at the exact moment, there was a message in my head said, the old gods are awakening again. Mm. So, um, and then I was also given a, uh, and I thought, well, what does that mean? You see, I, I don't have any Mexican ancestry, none whatsoever. I don't even speak Spanish, nothing, you know, I have no Mexican ancestry. So I somehow got the idea that I need to connect to my own ancestry. You know, and uh, what, what are the stories of my own ancestors? And then of course you, what I call the, the um, Germanic mythology has the curse of the Nazis uh, because they misrepresented. But what about before that? See, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you get into the whole story of the Indo-Europeans and the history of the Indo-Europeans, so always wandering and invading. You know, Indo-Europeans, the Europeans came from came from the east. Yeah, came, well, uh, yeah, around the around the. Uh, um, the yeah, around the Black Sea, you know, beyond the Caucasus, beyond the Caucasus, actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and get, gradually migrated in wave after wave. That was where again was there are waves of migrations, starting in like um, three thousand five hundred, the first wave, 
or even earlier than 7,000, 7,600, the first wave, wave after wave, every two or 3,000 years, coming yes. from into Europe, always going westward. Why? And they were pastoralists, they were nomadic pastoralists, they were sheep herders, goat herders, and horsemen. They were horsemen. They tamed the horse and they had the chariots. They had horses and chariots. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they were warriors, and so they, the, the indigenous people of Europe, of old Europe, who were farmers and sh sheep herders and settlers, they were no match because these guys came on their high horses and they just yeah. took over. Mm -hmm. They were bandits, marauding, no, nomadic bandits. They had a whole different culture. They had a whole different culture, very patriarchal, very warrior-like. And the, the people of old Europe were peace-loving. They were farmers. But of course, then you get invaded. You invade country, then you have to defend yourself. And so they started, you know, wave after wave of invasion, and then fighting and wars and coming back, and then and various myths. So this went on over thousands of years. And of course, then there was also merging of cultures, and people were intermarrying. And then stories were told of that. And so in the Well of Remembrance, I talk about many different myths of the Indo-Europeans and the conquering myths and the taking over, but then also the myths of reconciliation. Yeah, yeah. And, um, um, so the Odin, the Odin character is the searching for knowledge, and to me the Odin character is a kind of a key to the European psyche, the searching mm -hmm. for knowledge. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because in, uh, we usually think in uh, in Greek mythology, you know, and Europeans have all studied Greek mythology, and like Zeus is the father god, and Mercury, Hermes, is a son of Zeus, and is the god of communication. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Nordic Germanic myth, Odin, who is the equivalent of Mercury, he's the god of communication, and uh, he's the father god. Yeah. So it's a little different emphasis. So, you know, what, what I really love about Odin is that he um, integrates also his anima aspect when he wants to um, use the knowledge of Freya yeah. for his, um, he, he plucks uh, out his right eye, mm -hmm. offers it to Mirmir, Mirmir as well, mm. and then he has Freya teach him how to use the well of knowledge to foretell future, see knowledge from the future. I really like the fact that he bridges between animus and anima. Well, and he asks Freya, you know, he consults with Freya. Mm -hmm. He asks her and he consults with the, the because Freya knew the connection uh, to seership. Clairvoyance and prophecy, uh, the Verlvers, the yeah. Verlvers, and so you know he uh, he he son represents a counter. I mean, the Germanic society was very patriarchal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, but uh, the uh, Odin and uh, the seekers, you know, they so patriarchal in the sense that women were considered. A property and so forth, but they uh, they respected the woman as a household, and they respected the Verves had a special role, yeah. the seeresses, yeah. and so yeah. Odin and the warriors and the warrior kings and so forth, they would consult Verves. The Verves would go into a trance and be able to see the future. So if the warrior king might want to go to you know have have a battle and you know with the neighboring warrior king, Eric the Red, or whoever, uh, they would always consult the Velva first and say, well, is this, is this going to work out, this, this battle? And if the Velva said, no, no, you're going to get beaten, you know, you watch out. And uh, then they said, okay, well, let's postpone this till yeah. another yeah. time. But the Velva was also in terms of planting and farming, you know, is the weather going to be work out okay? And also in terms of the uh, the, um, the the sailors, the people that go out to sea and uh, you know go shipping, and they might be gone for days on end. Mm -hmm. you know? uh -huh. Are they going to come back? Are they safe? The rovers had a very very high role, and they were the priestesses of Freya. Mm -hmm. And there was uh -huh. even like a, 
their their fame ex extended so that um, the, even to the Romans there was a there was a famous verva who went to lived in Rome, and the Romans would consult her. And Tacitus, you know, wrote about the Roman historians wrote about uh, uh, Germanic uh, women and how the uh, Germanic tribes held women in high regard, and especially, and they believed that women had a special gift of seership. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Men could learn it also, but women were more, more naturally adept at it. Yeah. So, yeah. And the title, The Well of Remembrance, it came to you from a dream about a well. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, that I, then the, and yeah, the dream pointed me to to a story, and also I was given uh, some readings by uh, a um, uh, through a friend of mine, a woman who had a connection to uh, a seer uh, from the Basque country, whom I never actually met, um, who told her that uh, I should read the myth, the myths of Odin. Wow. I never met him. I only, you know, uh, uh, but my friend knew knew him, and she asked him, and he told her uh, that um, um, he should look into the mythology of Odin as very relevant, and which I then found it was very relevant, <laughs> because uh, uh, particularly in two areas, in the area of like searching and seeing and searching for what knowledge, so the knowledge seeking path. Now there's a part of Odin. Odin is also a warrior. Now the warrior path does not, you know, does not uh, have a particular appeal to me. I'm not. That's not a. That's not a big part of my world going, going around. So, but but that's okay. See, the, the deities uh, in all the mythologies have many different aspects. So I relate more to the uh, <clears throat> to the knowledge seeking aspect and the, the search for knowledge because Odin has these different. Different, three different stories about searching for knowledge. One of them is looking into the well of remembrance. Yeah. And the well of remembrance is uh, where everything is stored. And it's basically the life on earth. And, because the everything roots is, of the life tree. Yes, the roots of the li of the life tree, which is basically the planet. When you think about it, mm -hmm. you know, the world tree is basically the planet. It's the axis of the planet. So when we when uh, scientists go and read the geology of the rocks, they go to the Grand Canyon and they read and they see the different layers. Oh, and then 100 million years ago, this was this was going on, and then 250 million years ago, this was going on, and then 350 million ago, this was going on. They're looking into the well of remembrance, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Earth itself. And uh, but the shamans see learn to go uh, into the well of remembrance to ask personal questions. And and then people, ordinary people like warriors or other seekers, could consult the shaman, and he would, and that would be like analogy to like what nowadays you go to a psychotherapist, say a psychoanalyst, and he said, well, I have these problems, and the psychoanalyst, psychotherapist might say, well, we have to look into the past, into your childhood, and then we do that, you know, look at the Freudian childhood. Now maybe your know, Jungian psychology, you go into the the, uh, the past of the culture. And the mythology of the culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe you also some psychotherapists like myself and others, you know, maybe go on, b beyond your childhood and go into the ancestors, maybe several generations back, and maybe go into past lives. That would also be part of the well of remembrance, and so that would be you know, the personal seeker could go to find knowledge for the self, but then also the historian, you see. The well of remembrance would also be relevant to the historian. Mm -hmm. You want to know, well, okay, so what happened to our people? So our people were invaded by the Indo-Europeans from the east. But of course they didn't just come and take over, they fought back. And so you had the struggle back. So, um, um, so Odin, there's the three myths of Odin. One is he looks into the well of remembering in order to uh, obtain knowledge from the past and that's a divination and it ties into personal history collective history goes it back into archaeology 
paleontology, right? the sciences of the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Thomas Mann says at the beginning of the opening line of the Joseph and his brothers, he says, the, the, the well of the past is deep. In fact, it's infinitely deep. No matter how far you go, you can never find the depths of it. Because how far are you going to go? The origin of the Earth? Origin of the solar system? Origin of the galaxy? The Big Bang? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so key feelings, feelings and health from, from the water that is safe in the well, yeah. is sheltered. And the there. thing about the well is that there's always a, a double movement. You go into the past, but you come back. You go into the past to drink from the well of remembrance, or there's different ways of doing it. Or, uh, uh, but you have to, then you have to take a cup or a bucket and bring the well up in order to water up in order to drink it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which means that so the memory and remembering is always a double movement. You don't want to just go into the memory and stay there. You see, that's actually a, a hang up. Now, people who get fixated in the past. Yeah. And uh, you have to, so it's always a double movement, which is a, uh, you, you go in and you either take water in your hands or with a, with a cup, you lower it, and then you drink it. That means you, you remember and then you think about, well, what does that mean for me? What does it mean that I had a traumatic experience in my childhood? Or what does it mean for the German people that they have this history with the Nazis. It's not just, you know, pointing the finger and it's not just saying this is guilty and guilty and guilty. The point is, what does it mean? What did we learn from it, see? Mm -hmm. What do we learn from it? When you look at politics today, people are learning nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And the Europeans, uh, I have to say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an Amer I'm a native European, but now I'm an American. The Americans are learning nothing. Hmm. Not learning from their history. They're not learning from their history of the Native Americans. So the Europeans have actually learned more. I would say, from the overall point of the view, the Europeans have learned more because they've had to. They've suffered through all these wars, and so anyway. So that's the relevant. But so the other story about Odin is that. Um, 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 is that he uh, goes to the, um, he gets himself hung up on the world tree. Yes. And uh, he voluntarily hangs himself on the world tree. So it's not like Jesus getting nailed up on the cross. He self-sacrifices. Yep. Sacrifices himself in the Edda, very interesting line, I sacrificed myself to myself. Mm -hmm. What a strange thing to be doing. And the way I interpret that is in a Jungian way, it's you sacrifice my lower self, you might say the ego, to the higher self, the mm -hmm. spirit self. You know, put the two in perspective. And uh, he did that uh, by fasting, you know, having himself not nailed up to the cross, but hanging himself. It's a very different in story than the one of nailing somebody up to the cross as a punishment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then I, I'm going up there. This is this like a vision quest. Yeah. It's the ordeal vision quest. Very widespread in North America and in European. Going fasting in the desert, in the wilderness, isolation. You know, isolation, going to a hermitage get rid of, uh, stop eating, stop, you know, fasting, 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 on hanging on the cross. And then he was hanging on the cross, just reflecting on his situation, and he looks down at the ground, and on the ground he sees the sticks making these patterns. And the patterns, as he looks at them, they, they realize they're meaningful, and meaning kind of jumps up. And those are the runes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a divination method which he then teaches to his followers. Yeah, and I, I like the way that you write in the book that he hears the energy of the, the plants, of the vegetation, that yeah. he can understand that. Yeah. 
So I wanted to ask you if the runes had a, that special meaning for you. Well, that story does. I, I've not, you know, gone into casting the runes and uh, casting the runes as a me method of, of uh, divination. <laughs> I used to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I was a student, I, I did that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely valid and it's interesting. And I've studied it a little bit, but I don't do it that often. I do the more like the I Ching. And, mm -hmm. Uh, it's an ancient Chinese system, also similar. You're looking at little patterns of stones and you know, like that. Patterns of stones or bones or runes. These are all different technologies of, of accessing a greater knowledge than your personal knowledge. Because yeah. that's yeah. including the, the tarot. You see, you look at these pictures, but um, there's no fixed interpretation. The interpretation is always a matter of what's going on in your mind and what's going on in your life. You see. Uh, so, um, and anyway, so that's the, the uh, but it's a, it's a secret language, but it's only secret if you, that means you, you, you have to engage the process with your own personal, pro your own personal understanding. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not like looking up something in a book or an encyclopedia. And, uh, although, of course, there are books in the encyclopedia that say this rune means that and this rune means that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, is there, there are also um, um, a symbolic meaning uh, in sacrificing his right eye and not his left? No? I don't know that it is the right eye. Is it the right eye? I thought so. I don't know that any of the myths really specify which eye it is. Oh, I thought I had read that. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's left open, as far as I know. Oh. But maybe some of the stories, maybe, say. But then, you know, in the Eddas, I don't, I don't know. In the original Eddas, I don't think it says. Oh. Be wrong. Okay. No, I think, well, the way I interpreted the one eye, <clears throat> Is that he gives one, he gives up one eye, but what does he gain? You see, yeah, he, yeah. because the one eye that he gives up is the price that he paid, because he comes to the well of remembrance, yeah. and Mimir, who is the guardian of the well of remembrance, and Mimir is memory, and Mimir says, well, to drink from the well you have to pay. This is a very important principle that the Germanic people understood and ancient people understood. That knowledge is not free; it has to be paid for. It has to be earned. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't earn it, you don't value it. You see, mm -hmm. you don't value knowledge that you don't earn. And so he, just, he loses death, but he, he gains innovation. So when you when somebody went to the vulva and wanted to do a divination, they always have to pay money, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, that's true today. You go to a psychotherapist, you go to a tarot reader, you pay the money. So Odin, uh, you know, came to the Mimir, Mimir, who is the guardian of the world tree. He's the keeper of the axis. He represents the axis of the world. And his name means memory. And he says, well, I want to drink from the well of remembrance. And he's, Mimir said, well, what are you going to pay? And he paid one eye which is very, very high value. Mm -hmm. For the Germanic people, that was one of the things that they, they placed a very, very high value on knowledge, more important than anything else. And so they, um, because knowledge was power, uh, and uh, it wasn't like the internet is available everywhere. It's <laughs> <laughs> a different kind of knowledge anyway, you see. True knowledge is uh, knowledge uh, that you know from your own experience. It's not something you learned, and it's not a belief, and it doesn't matter whether you say it or not. You know it. You know it. You know it. So, um, so he paid the price of that. The meaning of that story is that you have to pay something. Now, it doesn't mean that necessarily you have to give up your eye in order to drink from the well of remembrance. Odin did, but you have to give up something. What the question, what it makes you ask the question, what, what are you willing to pay? And I love in English, you see, there's a phrase called you pay, you pay attention. Mm -hmm. 
You pay attention. It's interesting. It's I don't know how it is in Swedish, but in German you say schenk die Aufmerksamkeit. This is a gift. Mm -hmm. uh, but either way, you see, whether you pay or you give it as a gift, it's something that you actively do. You don't just sit there and take it in. But what is it in Swedish? How do you say uh, what? Oh, you. In, in you Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, what? How do you say there? Opletter. Which means what? Opletter. Pay attention. Pay attention. Opletter. It's also. Yeah. Up. So it's a payment. It's something active. It's yeah. not just there, like in the movies, taking it in. See? Um, so it's seek. It's searching. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and it indicates the high value of it. Yeah. So. It doesn't mean that we all have to give up an eye, obviously, it doesn't matter. <laughs> give up something of value. You want to ask yourself, uh, well, what am I, what is it worth to me? And, uh, it's very, very shamanic, you see. Yeah. Uh, when you go on a shamanic vision quest, you fast. So first of all, you give up your comfort. And you may even go through an ordeal, some of the North American shamanic traditions involved. A kind of an ordeal where you have to suffer fast and even go without water or you know have hooks put in your flesh and hang out and that kind of thing and Odin after all he is hanging you know it's mm -hmm. all part of payment of it's not masochistic it's like a, a, a way of focusing your receptivity you know getting rid of the irrelevancy and the ego stuff yeah and he paid with his eye to gain knowledge on how to um, prevent the war or make up the war between the sky gods and the earth gods, the Aesir and the Vanir gods. So it was an act of peace. Of of, and we we always see Odin, Wotan as the war god, but this was a sacrifice made for peace. Yes, yeah, so and well, he he went searching. He went he went on a search to find ways to make peace with but this the you know giving looking into the well of remembrance is a basically a divination like the runes it's also looking at the pattern of the sticks and stones okay. is a divination okay. obtaining knowledge looking into the well of the past it's okay, like obtaining knowledge it's sort of like psychotherapy psychoanalysis you know Freud you could say was a uh, Odin figure you know. Uh, even although he may not have mentioned them, but Freud actually used to have s statues of different deities right up in his in his office, and right behind where he was sitting. <laughs> so even though he's not going to, all these myths about gods and goddesses is all bullshit, all nonsense, uh, all all from the Oedipus complex. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But he had all the statues and images there. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh -huh. secretly, see, he was. Unconsciously, it's still connecting to those old spirits. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that I loved about the Well of Remembrance was the love you sh you share with us for words and the origin of words. And Odin was also a poet. Is uh, is that uh, one of the reasons that you love words so much? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And the origins of words. And I love studying, you know, since I know German and uh, English and not very much any other language, but those two languages I'm also and always translating. And all my books have been pretty much all my books have been translated into German. And sometimes I work on the translations myself. <laughs> and uh, the Well of Remembrance has appeared in German and in in English and and uh, I teach in German. Mm -hmm. uh, I travel to Germany, uh, Switzerland every every year and teach there workshops. In fact, I'm leaving in a couple of weeks. Oh! oh. So, uh, and, uh, um, so then, yeah, and uh, so those are the two languages that I love. Because the language is like layers, you know, it's like a, well, it's like layers and it's like, a, it's like geology is arranged in layers. And the, la the language is like a, it's actually more like a plant or a tree or a bush because the, the, the way the different um, concepts change in their language and then sometimes will change in, into their opposite. 
For example, when I, the, um, that's why uh, rem remembering, I don't know what the, what the Dutch word is for rem memory. Remember. That's which is like in German. It's also uh, in them, yeah. which is kind of means like think, looking at it in inside in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But in English, it's a very different word. A very interesting word. Remembering is the opposite of dismembering. See, it's reconnecting. Member a yeah. member is like a connecting link. So reconnecting to something that has been disconnected is the meaning of remembrance. That's why I call it the well of. Remem remembrance rather than just memory. Yeah. Oh. To put it together uh, again. Yeah, put it yeah. together oh. again. Uh, that which has been disconnected either through forgetfulness or through trauma or some other way. That's what happened. Trauma, traumatic experiences, PTSD, a memory gets frozen and then inaccessible and we don't less learn the lessons of the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so great when uh, people with PTSD start to dream again in symbols and not yeah. literally re-experiencing what they yeah. went through. Yeah. The symbols are helpful because they, they allow you to um, express something and experience something that's difficult to uh, experience personally because it's so painful. Yeah. Well, you've, we've spoken about two ways that Odin gains knowledge, but there's a third way uh, that is about reconciling opposites with the uh, Aesir and Nirvana gods. Mm -hmm. And uh, you touched upon that uh, in, in a little bit uh, in your story about um, the well, uh, about the hanging from the tree. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this uniting. Uh, separate units of concepts. Has it also been a guiding concept in your own life? Of course, yeah. All these concepts are, uh, yes. <laughs> That's the whole point of the of the book. You know, is to constantly point out that these myths are relevant to mm -hmm. people today. Mm -hmm. And uh, myself included, and others too, because uh, you know the story of the the, uh, the reconciliation between the Asir and the Vanir um, is um, is the story of warfare. You know, and how do you yeah. trans how do you transform war into peace? Yeah, and uh, Ragnarok will will reappear again. So how do you see it in, in we see it everywhere in the, in the news, war, it's, it just keeps yeah. going on. Right. Right. When will we learn? Yeah. How do we learn? Well, you know, one of the lessons is that, uh, the, see, the, Euro the, the, uh, the uh, European people did learn, you know, people do learn, mm -hmm. and they learn, they make peace. And then they forget again, and yeah. seven generations later, yeah. they forget yeah. again, and you know they get caught up. You know, it's like people, you know, couples, men and women, married or brothers and sisters, and you know, they get along, and then something happens. They start fighting over money or over sex or whatever, <laughs> and then uh, then they, if they work on it, you know, you know. That's what therapists do, help you resolve the conflicts. Mm -hmm. But it can be uh -huh. it can be on the individual level, could be on the family level, could be on the group level. Racist, uh, you know, different cultural group, blacks and whites, uh, uh, rich people, and now in in Europe, uh, all the 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 in local inhabitants, they're all freaking out because of the, all these African people coming across mm -hmm. the Mediterranean, uh -huh. flooding Europe. With hundreds and tens of thousands of people who want to just live, you know, we're just fleeing from disaster. Yeah, yeah. And how are the Europeans going to deal with them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the Euro it's the same thing as the Europeans, the old Europeans, you know, two or three, several thousand years before Christ. All of a sudden, these floods of immigrants came from Central Asia. On horses. Now the ones from, coming from Africa, they're not coming on horses. They're coming in rickety boats. 
And they're just washing up on the start. Here we are. Hundreds of people, thousands of people, they have nothing, nothing. What are we going to do? What are the Europeans going to do? It's a big problem. Mm -hmm. See, <laughs> no, it's present, see? So those old myths are very relevant, aren't they? Yeah. Are there still groups that work with those uh, northern mythology? There are groups that work with the northern mythology, yeah. And uh, I, I don't have any particular contact with them. Um, some of them are a little weird, you know. Uh, they, they, but it's okay. They, they like to dress up and, you know, put on the costumes and the helmets and the horns and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> it doesn't really interest me. It's, it's okay. It's harmless. Now maybe maybe in the pre war there are some fringe groups too who who then get a little racist about it, you know, where they not only you know, they get the and this racist thing that this one race is somehow superior to the other in whatever way. <coughs> well, the racist militarist thing thing. But that can happen anywhere, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. You conclude the book uh, with a vision of the return of the Vanir gods living in harmony with Aesir. Do you see that in the dreams of any individual group? Well, there are movements, yes, there are peace movements. There are lots of different peace movements. There's movements and, uh, that, uh, you know, that advocate a return to ecological farming principle. Mm -hmm. You know, farming and gardening and getting away from industrialized farming and uh, mega, you know, exploit the whole corporate superstructure, going back to um, growing your own food and, you know, getting back to the roots on the land. So kind of uh, not to counter, not to fight against the sort of world-dominating imperialist industrialized empire, but to uh, cultivate, you know, cultivate local food, organic food, healthy food, eat close to the, eat natural food, get away from denatured chemical food like that. So those are, you know, those people, they may not know about and the myths of Odin, they don't care about the myths of Odin. That's, that's not their thing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. these myths are archetypal myths yeah. uh, of farmers and growers and and people that want to live peacefully. The Vanya gods were peaceful. They didn't fight because they had enough food to eat and they had enough fisheries and farming and fishing. They, they didn't have a need to fight. They didn't, uh, so the fighting started with, uh, you know, originally, and that's no excuse, of course, but then once, see, once somebody starts, if you have a group of people, they're living together, if one person starts a fight, then everybody has to fight. You know, if somebody starts a fight and then everybody starts to fight, you take sides and you defend yourself. You're going to steal from me, then I'm going to defend myself. It's, it's natural. Or if you're going to hurt my sister, then I'll have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So it's very tricky, you see. Not a simple. So that's an ongoing challenge for the Europeans and for everybody, for everybody. So these myths are not just for Europeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just as relevant for us for, you know, dealing, dealing with now. How, how are we, the Europeans, now? Uh, you know, and, 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 and the United States, it's the Mexicans. How are we going to deal with the Mexicans that are flooding? Of course, they're building a wall to keep the Mexicans out, a 12-foot high wall. And, uh, uh, and if they do come through, we just, you know, put them in a prison. We don't want them. And the European the same thing. We don't want them. We don't have a we don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. But the people keep coming. Well they have nothing. They have even less. The people coming from Africa, they're going on a boat and sailing, you know, a rowboat up the coast of Africa. They may not even make it. They have nothing. Nobody leaves their home and family because they're feeling happy. <laughs> they leave it out of desperation. Same with the Mexicans who you know, try to cross the border or dig a tunnel underneath the wall. They're not leaving because they're happy and they just want to be tourists in North America. They're leaving because they can't feed their family or they're being killed and persecuted and tortured and imprisoned. That's always the story, been the story. That's still the story, which means it's not over. It's not over and we still have to learn it. We have to learn it again and again and again. 
what are we what are we learning? See, that's what Odin needs to learn. Okay, what, what are we learning? And what are we learning in the lessons of how conflict starts and more important how to how to how to stop the conflict and how to reconcile. That's a, the, you need a rituals of reconciliation. You need peacemaking rituals. You know, it was interesting because in the story they talk about uh, one peacemaking ritual that that uh, failed and then another one that succeeded. You know, at first they did an exchange of emissaries, but the Vanir gods didn't like that the emissary that the Asia gods sent. They said, "We don't like this guy. He's he's not worth anything." You know. If you want to send us an ambassador, we need some. We want somebody important. Not this this guy. He never says anything. So then they had to create this ritual. They created this elaborate ritual of eating together and drinking together from uh, this this drink that also was a memory drink, quasir. Nobody knows what was in this quasir. It's some kind of fermented beverage. It was not so much the beverage itself. Although nowadays people take these psychoactive, psychoactive drugs that help you to remember your past, you see. And of course that was a lot of my history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, the, the drinking together means that you sit together in council, you share a meal, you share stories, and uh, you respect one another on the basis of equality. Then you talk, you see. You talk and you drink together and you talk. You work out your differences that way, not through fighting. When you put down when you sat together, when you entered somebody's house, the old Germanic people, when you entered somebody's house, you took your sword off. Now, then when you get outside again, you take your sword off again. And if a stranger came to your house, they were always welcome first. A stranger comes to your house first, you take your sword off, come in, Eat with us, stay the night. Then, you know, if we have something to work out, we work it out. We have something to exchange, we do we trade. We exchange goods and services, we exchange, you see. Rather we talk and communicate, we exchange gifts. Trade. Trade, don't fight. And so the Europeans we're all struggling to do that, right? Trying to work it out. So the diplomats get together and say, well, how can we do this? How can we accommodate these people? Yeah. Talking is always better. Uh, and, and then celebrating, talking, and then celebrating, agreeing and celebrating. Yeah. It's not simple, you see, it's not simple. No. Started because people talk and they lie. Mm -hmm. When they say things, they, they'll use deception. But the ri ritual can be kind of a glue to get all things, to get all noses uh, aimed at the same side. Yeah, the the, and the the rituals of the of reconciliation are based on a respect for the other person's uh, individuality and the other mm -hmm. person's identity. Respecting, respecting means equality. No, no, no uh, superiority or inferiority, yeah. Yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, see, the Europeans are not doing that with Putin and the Russians. Yeah, yeah. The Europeans and the Americans are saying to Putin, you know, we know best, and and, and you're no good, and you know, we we want what we want. And Putin just said, I mean, he's the Russian bear. You don't futz around with the bear. I disagree completely with the European and the American policy. I think it's mostly the Americans, but the Europeans should stand up to the Americans and not, you know, not dictate because they're they're closer to Russia and they know the Russians better. The Russians lost 25 million people in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't bait the bear. You don't push the troops right up to the Russian borders. That's totally disrespectful. It's insane. It's insane. It's provocative. It doesn't really have anything to do with Odin, but Odin, see, would understand that. And if you understood the old stories, you would understand that. You respect your enemies. You respect those who are your neighbors, you, who have, you share the borders with. Yeah, yeah. And the tribe you, animal. You trade, you trade, of course, you exchange gifts. That's why I love that ritual of reconciliation, the ex exchanged ambassadors. 
That's what the European the Europeans are, uh, are trying to do. That the European Union was a beautiful example of that kind of reconciliation. They said, "Well, we've had two fucking wars, you know, mm -hmm. where we've lost millions of our people. We don't want to do this anymore." Now, lots of problems, of course. We all know that. It's not working out yeah. as well as we thought, but you know, it's it's still ongoing. Yeah. The principle of uh, mutual respect is uh, principle that's, that's throughout it's these traditional uh, shamanic mythologies and indigenous people. The indigenous people, like the Native Americans, they always have that. Total respect. You talk to, you respect your opponents, you respect strangers, uh, and you have this hospitality. The Germanic people have a fundamental principle of ethical principle of hospitality. That's deeper than the Christian. In the, in the Christian thing comes love thy neighbor, and that's okay. But the Germanic people had that already. You respect your neighbor, respect the equality. Don't assume that it's an enmity. Now, if there conflict is, then you have to work out the conflict. Mm -hmm. But you start by respecting your neighbor. Hey, we're on this. We're on this world together. <laughs> here, here, here you are, and here I am. Yes. How are we going to interact? Yes. <laughs> Learn from each other. Maybe we'll trade. You know, you have some jewels, and I have some food or whatever, and we'll celebrate. And we'll celebrate. And maybe we'll marry each other. The young men will marry the young girls, and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Children <laughs> raise families. <laughs> You have to have peace to raise family. Yeah. You have to raise peace, peace to grow food. And you, you start fighting, you're wasting all the resources. Yeah. Spend in building bombs and rockets and missiles and ships. And, and sacrificing the young people. Yeah. Sacrificing the young people for nothing. Yeah. Now they've decided the whole Iraq war was for nothing. Yeah. It was based on a mistake. It's not based on a mistake, it was based on an intentional misdirection was an intentional mistake. Not like, oops, I'm sorry, you didn't really have any rockets or weapons of mass destruction. Sorry, we made a mistake. No, yeah, we made a mistake. It was an intentional mistake. We all knew it. We all knew it because I was pregnant at the time with my second child and I felt the ache in, in my stomach. Oh no, yeah. no, please do, don't do this. We all knew it. It was a lie that they, yeah. Yeah, yeah I had the same thing. I had, you know, I had, we had, my wife and I, we had two small children under the age of 10 in our house at the time when Bush uh, invaded Iraq. And he said, oh no, not again, you know. How am I going to even explain this to my children? <laughs> Fortunately, I was so young, I couldn't explain it to them. I didn't need to, you know, until much later. And, um, by this time, and uh, so you you know that, and so that those stories are there. That's why it's important to remember the stories of people living peacefully together. And that's why Maria Gambutas agreed to write the foreword. Mm -hmm. You know, uh -huh. and, uh, you know, remember how the Vanya, the Vanya are basically peace loving. They, I mean, it's not like they were all good and their Indo-Europeans were all bad, but. Um, you know, they, they had a relatively peaceful civilization for a long, long time. For a long, long time. And then some of the scholars say, well, we don't really know the evidence doesn't have it. Blah, blah, blah. But that's what where Maria Reagan Buddha, I mean, she didn't, she was an archaeologist. You know? She didn't know, she didn't know that. She didn't expect it. She was an Indo-European specialist. She was a specialist in weapons. And then she had this dream of you know, drowning in weapons. And then she was digging, 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 digging down. What did you dig her down? Well, then, then you dig down, you know, another couple of hundred years before that, then there's no fortifications, and there's no hilltop forts. And there's just everybody living, you know, the houses are just by the side of the river. And there's no weapons, no weapons buried with the chieftain. The chieftain is just buried with his family and his cows and cattle. No weapons. They didn't value weapons. They didn't need weapons, see. If you have enough for everybody, then what do you need weapons for? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but then things changed. Yeah. But yeah. that means it can that means it can change again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why you want to drink from the well of memory, and uh, remember how it was. Yeah. You know, yeah. and drink to drink the quasia that uh, and trade trade instead of fighting. Get married, make love, make children. <laughs> <laughs> grow plants, you know. Grow healthy plants. Yeah. Cultivate the soil. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Well, maybe this is the moment for you to tell some, or something more about the greenearthfound.org that yes. you have, the website. It's a non, it's a non profit. Mostly it helps me publish my books and, uh, um, and distribute them. So I self publish many of my own books and distribute them myself. So. Okay. okay, is there a final question? that I haven't asked you and that you really, really would like to answer. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It's up to you. It's your show. <laughs> well, I was enjoying <laughs> you and all your stories. We could talk for hours about the different stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's one thing, that, uh, the one thing though that I think you got slightly off there and you say, I dedic somewhere you say I dedicated my book to, uh, what did you say? Dedicated to Odin. That's not true. I didn't dedicate it to Odin. Oh, okay. I'll read you the dedication. Uh -huh. uh, I told the story about Odin. and um, uh, So this is a good way to end. Yeah. I told the story yeah. about Odin and his influence on me. But here's the dedication. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. To our ancestors who kept and told for us the ancient stories. Our brothers and sisters who love the earth with all her beings. Our descendants who will inherit the earth and hear and tell again the ancient stories. Wow. That's the dedication. Thank you. All right. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about these old stories that I like very much. Yeah. Well, if you are in Germany and you are near the Dutch um, border, give me a call. Yes, and you have my website, and, and uh, you can get my newsletter. Yes, I, I registered for your newsletter. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>